On Tech News Today, Amazon is getting ready to launch a streaming TV service. Microsoft announces Office for iPad, better late than ever, I guess. BlackBerry remains optimistic despite a grim earnings report. And somebody created an Oculus Rift interface for, you guessed it, Facebook. All that and more coming up next. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. Tech News Today for Friday, March 28th, 2014. This episode is brought to you by Squarespace, the all-in-one platform that makes it fast and easy to create your own professional website or online portfolio. For a free two-week trial and 10% off, go to squarespace.com and use the offer code TNT. And by NatureBox, where you can order great-tasting, healthy snacks delivered right to your door. Forget the vending machine and get in shape with healthy, delicious treats like citrus chipotle chickpeas. Get 50% off your first box. Go to naturebox.com slash twit. That's naturebox.com slash twit. Welcome to Tech News Today. I'm Mike Elgin. I'm Jason Howell. Tech News Today explores the big stories of the day in conversation with some of the world's best journalists. Our guest co-anchor today is Elise Hu, an online and on-air reporter for NPR. Welcome, Elise. Thank you. Glad to be here. So glad to have you. Why don't we jump right into the news because we've got plenty of it. Amazon is expected to announce a new streaming TV service on Wednesday. The company sent invitations out yesterday. Reports based on leaked, leaks, unnamed sources, and those annoying people familiar with the matter have suggested a set-top box that streams TV shows, movies, and music videos, and possibly that plays games as well. At least, do you think that uh, that all the rumors are true here or possibly some of them? I mean, f for example, yesterday, the uh, Wall Street Journal reported that it would be a free advertising-supported uh, service, and then immediately Amazon denied it and said, no, that's not going to happen. So, so where would you, if you had to guess, where would you peg this announcement? Well, we know something is happening. Um, Amazon has apparently sent out invites to its um, sort of journalists that cover it already for New York next week. So something is coming. Um, and my first reaction to advertising supported streaming sounded like that sounds like a lot, a lot like television, right? So I'm curious how it's going to differentiate itself. I'm guessing it, the big di differentiator is hardware of some kind um, so that it can better compete with Roku and Apple TV. Yeah, and it's a tough market because there are so many powerful companies trying to get into this market. On the other hand, I think a lot of people have counted Amazon out in the past, especially in like the tablet space. Uh, you know, people thought, well, you know, they're getting into the hardware business first with the Kindle and then with the tablets. Uh, and people said, well, you know, they're, they're they're an online bookseller slash you know online retailer. What are they doing making consumer electronics gadgets? Uh, they can't possibly succeed. And I think it's safe to say that both the Kindle and the, you know, the Kindle Fire a Android based Kindles uh, are successful for Amazon. Uh, they're essentially cash registers that they're putting in the hands of their customers in addition to being places where they can view downloadable content. And uh, one of the uh, strategies of this is almost certainly the fact that with streaming media and having more of their customers using streaming media, not only movies and TV shows and so on, but also music, et cetera, they'll be able to better sort of serve up contextual advertising. For example, sure. they may they may determine that people who know who watch certain types of TV shows are likely to buy certain types of products. And of course, that's always been the case with uh, TV advertising. But in their case, they may be able to refine that plus add it to information they know about people's buying habits on Amazon. Do you think this is a big part of the strategy? Yeah, it sounds like it would be. And you mentioned Kindle. Kindle ended was a piece of hardware that then became a portal for um, consumers to then buy more Amazon-related products or uh, products that Amazon was making available. Titles, book titles, for, ex uh, for example. What I am, what I think is still unclear for the consumer, though, is um, how this really makes our experience better. Because as it is now, fragmentation seems to be the biggest problem, right? Like I can find some titles on Hulu, but not on Netflix. I can find some titles on Netflix, but those go away in a month or at a time that's very difficult to determine. Amazon is now going to be a distributor or a studio in itself. It's already doing its own show, right, betas. Um, and so there's going to be some titles I can get on Amazon, but then not on Netflix and Hulu. So the fragmentation question, I think, is a piece of this puzzle that has not been solved. Absolutely. And the worst part of it is, as you mentioned, the content. It's looking like we're uh, entering into a world where it will be essentially a po impossible to see every show, uh, or any <laughs> show at least. I mean, who wants to watch every show? Uh, but, uh, but you know, that's going to be a big problem. 
But, you know, I think people tend to look at Amazon as a sophisticated online retailer and kind of forget that they are a major, you know, they're almost like Google in the sense that they are uh, algorithmically, al algorithmically centered. They're, they're, they have very sophisticated algorithms. For example, let me give you two examples. Years ago, before anyone was doing any of this uh, sort of contextual advertising that everybody's talking about now, I mean, I'm talking like more than a decade ago, Amazon was doing recommendations, book recommendations. Essentially how that worked is you would buy book A, B, and C, and then they had algorithms that found, you know, thousands of other people who also like those books. And then book D is the one that those other people also like. So they would recommend book D. But the effect on the end user was like, wow, how did they know that I would really want that book? So they were the first major company to use algorithms to essentially sell things in a customized, uh, granular way. Another way they've used algorithms, which is you know one of the scariest uses of, of these algorithms, I think, uh, to a certain extent, and there was a great piece in Slate.com about this, was when they decided they wanted to acquire diapers.com, and I guess they decided right. the price was too high, and so they have these price algorithms. So every time a certain diaper-related product would have a certain price at diapers.com, they would instantly reprice their diapers or that, that exact same product lower, and so diapers.com could never have a lower price than Amazon. And, you know, the value of the company plummeted and then and then Amazon bought them for a song. And now they just sort of, you know, uh, have taken them on as their own company. So they're, they're really deadly with these algorithms. And so this TV thing, you have to you think, well, why would they be a media company? Why would they have a set dot box? Why would they become a gaming company, for example? Um, well, it's not it has nothing to do with any of that stuff. It's got to be all about the data. Data, of course. Yeah. So uh, it's. Amen, Mike. I agree with you. Yeah, so it's it's really interesting, and really, Jeff Bezos is probably the smartest guy in technology. He is he is disciplined and very very smart. So anything he does, you can never just dismiss it and say, well, they don't know what they're doing. They probably do know what they're doing. Well, in a sec, we're gonna we're gonna look at Microsoft's new Office for iPad in more detail. But first, I want to tell you about Squarespace. Squarespace is an awesome site where you can build an incredible website, and they're one of our sponsors today. Uh, they have 25 beautiful templates to start with. And I always emphasize this point when we do Squarespace ads because this is really the key. I've been building websites since the mid-90s, I'm almost ashamed to admit. And, you know, for, for years and years, lots of companies have had templates and, you know, different types of help for building a website. There is nothing at all like Squarespace out there. It is so easy to use, and their templates are so beautifully designed. If you need help, they have tech support 24-7 via live chat or email. And of course, they all of their subscription plan ne levels now offer uh, e-commerce. So you can take money, whether you're selling things online or you just have a cash wedding registry or school fund drive or whatever it is that you need to do to collect money. Squarespace starts at just $8 a month and includes a free domain name if you sign up for a year. It's mobile ready both for the person creating the website and also for the people viewing your website if they see it on an an iPhone or an Android phone or any other type of mobile device, it'll look beautiful on the device, as beautiful as it can possibly look. And that's super important because, of course, we're increasingly entering into a mobile-centric world. And, of course, Squarespace takes care of all the hosting so you don't have to. Start a free two-week trial today with no credit card required and start building your website. When you decide to sign up for Squarespace, make sure you use the offer code TNT. And that'll get you 10% off. And it will also show your support for Tech News Today, which we appreciate. And we thank Squarespace for their support of Tech News Today. And remember that a better web awaits and it starts with your new Squarespace website. Well, Microsoft announced Office for iPad yesterday, including Word, Excel, and PowerPoint. Four years in the making, Office for iPad is getting generally positive reviews. And it's free to download, but the free version allows only the ability to read but not create or edit Word documents. You can, however, edit Excel spreadsheets and present with PowerPoint documents with the free version. Unlocking full functionality requires an Office 365 subscription, which starts at about 100 bucks a year for the home premium edition. Mark Hackman is a senior editor for PC World, and he's joining us here today to tell us about his review of this product. Welcome, Mark. Hi. So are you impressed by Office for iPad, and would you recommend it? I would, actually. I mean, I think there's a couple of caveats that we have to uh, sort of get out of the way up front. If you're a, a business user and you already own Office 365, then I think it's a no-brainer. Just go ahead and download it, uh, tie it into your Office 365 subscription. Uh, Office 365 Home Premium comes with uh, a license for five PCs and five tablets. Um, Office for iPad will take up one of those, but I think it's probably a, a rare family that actually owns both five PCs and f five tablets. Um, 
uh, quite frankly, I was, yeah, I was really impressed by it. Um, I think that it, uh, it's certainly the office that you know and love, but it's sort of distilled down to its basics. And it's also sort of, uh, you know, it fits very nicely within the iOS aesthetic. Um, so, uh, you know, it's, it's, like I said, it's, it's basically a no brainer. If you, if you, if you, if you like office, if you have an iPad, I would go get it. But Mark, is it too little too late at this point? I mean, have a lot of people, have a lot of consumers and users already moved on beyond um, needing Office on tablets? I mean, I think it's a valid question. Um, I personally think that just <laughs> given the fact that, you know, if you look at the app downloads today for, I, for, for iOS, I think, you know, Excel and Word, and, or sorry, Word and Excel and, and PowerPoint were one, two, three, and then, you know, you're also seeing them uh, on the top 10 on the paid apps. I think there's a lot of people sort of just um, have sort of waited for this for a long time and are now sort of taking advantage of this and at least checking it out. Um, you know, Apple takes its own 30% cut of the, or sorry, the, the, um, the Office 365 subscription. So uh, there are people obviously t taking it, downloading it, and, and paying for it. So um, it may in fact be too late in the grand scheme of things, but, you know, Microsoft's grand vision is to go ahead and put Office as well as its services on as many platforms as it can, and uh, you know this is just just part of that vision. Now, Mark, what are some of the best and worst features? If you can just you know whatever jumps out at you, uh, just so people can get a sense of how this might be different from other offerings on iOS. Sure, absolutely. Um, I think that far far and away the best feature of it is simply the way that it looks, as far as just integrating with iOS. I mean, if you leave, if you use the software. Um, it just feels very natural. It's um, not the laser pointer? The laser pointer isn't the best feature? Uh, no, actually, uh, I don't think that the laser pointer is the best feature. I think, frankly, just using it, just being, you know, tapping and highlighting words, seeing the way the text sort of reflows. Um, you know, the, the thing of it is, is you actually mentioned you, the laser pointer. I mean, that's one of the, in, in, in some ways, that's actually one of the weak points about it because, you know, when you're, when you're presenting a document, you're sort of used to um, taking a, a presentation and sort of looking at your speaker notes and then, uh, you know, you know, showing the, the, the PowerPoint presentation to the, the, to the viewer. And, you know, if you're actually presenting it on the iPad, you know, it's sort of a one, you know, you, you can either present or you can look at your speaker notes. I mean, you'd have to sort of, you know, use a phone or a PC to sort of just uh, to get that functionality. Um, but, you know, you tap in a word, it highlights it, you, you know, things flow around it. The templates which you're showing right now are an excellent uh, capability. I think that one of the, uh, the weak points right now is, frankly, there's this lack of printing. Um, there is no capability, there is no actual, there's no option to print within uh, Office for iPad, which is, you know, <laughs> it's sort of embarrassing given the fact that, you know, you're an Office user, you want to print. Uh, you may not print all the time, but it's a capability you'd like to at least have. Uh, I work for, you know, I work for iOS offers that feature. Um, you know, Microsoft said that they're sort of taking a very Google-like approach, and so they're going to be, you know, iterating very quickly. They're going to be adding new features. They've added new features to Office 365 on almost on a weekly basis. Um, I would expect the printing will be added fairly soon, but for right now, it's not there, and, you know, it, it's embarrassing. It's like the, uh, the iPhone shipping without cut and paste. Now, you had hinted at one important fact, which is that this isn't a suite exactly. You download each app at a time, and, of course, mm -hmm. I believe Outlook is already... Uh, available on the App Store and has been, uh, and that's separately. So that's the other uh, uh, part of the suite that you would find elsewhere as a suite. But here, there are individual apps that uh, you can essentially pay for as a suite, as I understand it. Now, if you don't have an Office 365 subscription uh, and you want to just try this out and, and, and see how it goes, what can you do exactly with this if you don't pay for it? Oh, basically, well, <laughs> somewhat, very little, I suppose. I mean, you can actually view documents. Um, and you can actually connect to, well, if you, first of all, you can, you can view documents, which is useful in itself. And you can actually uh, connect it to a OneDrive account and take documents from that and view them as well. But that's essentially it. Um, you know, from a, it's, it's a freemium model, which means that it's basically trying to entice users to download it and then, you know, have them pay up for, you know, an Office 365 subscription. I mean, it's, 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 it has some decent capabilities by itself, but if you're looking at strictly free versus free, iWork actually is the better solution. Now, just very quickly, do you think this is better than the than the Surface version, the one that you would use on a Surface tablet? Yeah, I would actually, and I would really hope that um, you know next week at Build, for example, uh, Sasha Nadella, Microsoft CEO, implied that we're going to hear a little bit more about uh, uh, touch-based Office for the Surface and for um, you know other tablets as well, possibly Android. Um, and I would really hope, actually, that they sort of take this model and use this as the aesthetic, as this template going forward. Um, while I'm impressed by 
the Office Suite, or sorry, Office for iPad itself, um, you know, Office 2013 still has a legacy of just, you know, confusing, me confusing menus, uh, icons sort of scattered all over the place. And um, I, I think that if, if tablets are the wave of the future, then this is going to be sort of the, uh, the vanguard for a new generation of Office. Well, Mark, I want to thank you for joining us and telling us about uh, Office for iPad. Uh, thanks for taking the time. Uh, you can find Mark at PCWorld.com and also on Twitter at Mark Hackman. That's a the, his last name is spelled H-A-C-H-M-A-N. Well, BlackBerry released its fourth quarter earnings today, and as you might expect, things look pretty grim. Revenues are down 64%, dropping below $1 billion for the first time since 2007. The company lost $42 million for the quarter, but CEO John Chen is optimistic here to try to explain this optimism and BlackBerry's prospects for survival in an iOS and Android world is Verge editor Dan Seifert. Welcome, Dan. How you doing, Mike? I'm doing great, thanks. Is John Chen nuts, or does he have reason for optimism? <laughs> uh, he seems to be kind of nuts, right? Uh, which is, uh, <laughs> at least from the outside, when you're looking at the raw numbers, you've got, you know, like you mentioned, revenues are down 64%, significant drop there. They lost money this quarter. Uh, a year ago, they had actually earned a profit in the holiday quarter. So, you know, things are looking pretty grim. I think the source of his optimism, though, is the fact that he was able to uh, turn around their operating expenses significantly and uh, reduce those by about 51% compared to this quarter last year. So Dan, I feel like a lot of our coverage or a lot of just um, technology press coverage of BlackBerry has been what the end game is here. Um, <laughs> tell us sort of, or I guess predict for us how you see the end of, of BlackBerry if, if that is what we're getting closer to. You know, it's, it's, it's hard to say, but I really think that the, uh, the most uh, attractive aspect or, or prospect for BlackBerry is to either sell its software uh, divisions to uh, another company that can make better use of them or just go full hog into the, uh, the corporate world and, and completely uh, forget about the uh, consumer side of things. Now, BlackBerry uh, plans to differentiate with physical keyboards in a world where almost all of the major smartphones have full screen, you know, and on screen keyboards. Um, first of all, is that a winning strategy? For example, they're bringing back the BlackBerry Bold. Uh, do you think that that will thrill the existing base or the, the, the people who used to be big BlackBerry fans, for starters? And will they gain any new fans by adding keyboards, by emphasizing keyboards? So I think that's exactly what it'll do. It will thrill the existing customers, the people that have not fled for greener pastures for whatever reason or happen to be in a company that mandates that they still use a BlackBerry and doesn't allow them to bring their own iPhone or Android phone to work. Uh, and, you know, that core fan base is going to be really excited about these high-end phones that are allegedly coming that have keyboards and the menu bars and things like that. Uh, but for BlackBerry as a company, I don't see it... Uh, really letting them grow and bringing in new customers uh, to the fold because, you know, it, the fact of the matter is that people have moved on. You know, the, these phones that have big screens can do so much more when there isn't a physical keyboard in the way. So, I, you know, it, no, people aren't really clamoring for the keyboard like they were maybe even two years ago. Now, BlackBerry Messenger is available on iOS and Android uh, and soon on Windows Phone and the Nokia X. Uh, is this a significant business uh, for BlackBerry, or is this just sort of on the periphery? Uh, for BlackBerry, it's a significant business. It's not nearly as significant of a business as it could have been if they had opened it up to other platforms years ago. Uh, you know, if, if, if BlackBerry had gone multi-platform and released an iPhone version and then an Android version back in, say, 2010, we wouldn't be talking about WhatsApp today. We'd be talking about BBM. But uh, BBM still has uh, its core fan base, I guess. Uh, they report that they have 85 million active users, which is uh, the same number that they reported last year. It's about 5 million up from last quarter, I believe. So it's, it's slightly growing. Uh, and they say, or Chen says that you know, this part of their business is going to be where they're going to see growth uh, in the immediate term, and that uh, the, the, the long term is where the, the hardware business will produce more growth. I don't know if I really think that's going to happen per se. Uh, he, he is looking long term. He says that they don't expect a return to profitability until 2016, which is you know two years away. So uh, he, he's, he's playing the long game. Um, but you know, BBM, uh, it's important for BlackBerry. I don't know if it's important for the rest of the world.
Well, Apple uh, came back from the brink long ago and consolidated down to almost nothing and then rebuilt the company. But they did it with entirely new categories of devices rather than going back to the past and trying to recreate what they had before. So it does look grim indeed, and we'll be watching them. Hopefully uh, they will succeed somehow going forward because I think the world does need, uh, and certainly Canada needs, uh, a company that's offering, you know, uh, this kind of device. You know, some people want a, a physical keyboard. Some people like the messaging system that they have. So hopefully they will survive somehow. So I want to thank you for coming on and uh, telling us about this and uh, giving us your opinion on it. My pleasure. All right, you can find Dan at TheVerge.com and also on Twitter. Uh, you can follow him there by going to DC Seifert, and that's D-C-S-E-I-F-E-R-T. Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg yesterday provided some surprising facts about the company's previously announced Connectivity Lab. The group will use drones, satellites, and lasers to bring Internet access to remote places as part of Zuck's Internet.org project. Wow, this is, uh, does he have Google envy here? He just wants moonshot projects, or is he serious about using laser beams to bring Internet connectivity to remote parts of the world? Well, for context here, of course, Google has its Project Loon, which is attempting to bring internet connectivity through, what, balloons, right? Hot air balloons or something like that. Um, and so this is obviously the race to the, for the next billion. Um, my, my question about this, Mike, is uh, uh, this presumes that a lot of Africa doesn't have the kind of connectivity that we'd like them to see. I, I was, there was actually um, a piece that sort of countered this Zuckerberg notion saying that there was actually plenty of wireless connectivity in Africa already. So um, I'm just really curious how the, about the details of all of this. And lasers are really sexy, but how does that all work? I mean, this is sort of me pleading ignorance on, on lasers and the science of such. Yeah, absolutely. And, and he didn't even mention uh, Titan Aerospace, which, which Facebook is in the process of probably acquiring. Titan Aerospace makes airplanes that can stay aloft for like five years using solar power and these would be you know part of this mesh network relaying internet connectivity to remote parts of the world but i i agree with you it seems like the solution is unlikely to be things floating around in the sky uh what's really needed is just to build re regular infrastructure as you're seeing in places like Rwanda, we interviewed uh, uh, at one of the ministers from the Rwanda government recently who told us about what's happening in Rwanda. That's one way to do it. That seems like the right way to do it. Uh, and another way to do it is uh, is the way that Google is probably going to do it in Uganda. They're going to be doing Google Fiber in Uganda. So that, that's uh, that's the kind of thing that places like Africa sorely need. Vast, the vast majority of the continent doesn't have anything like that. So that would be a better place to start than balloons and drones and laser beams and robots or wh whatever else they're going to do um it sounds almost to me like uh like they you know like zuckerberg maybe yeah, just wants to play with stuff uh or something and so um but i don't know uh, but drones knows? always get attention right of course you you'll recall it wasn't it was just a few months ago when jeff jeff bezos announced uh amazon shipments by drone which which made a very buzzy news cycle for a couple of days so um this is sure to get us talking about it, and here we are, right? As if we weren't talking about Facebook already <laughs> buying <laughs> Oculus know. Rift this week. So it's been a crazy <laughs> they newsworthy They didn't week. do anything. Yeah, they didn't do anything this week. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Just sitting around uh, playing uh, virtual reality games and, and, and using their remote control toys. Well, it's, uh, it's all very fascinating, and, and Zuck has suddenly become a very interesting billionaire. We'll be watching that. Indeed. <laughs> well, in a sec, we're going to give you a follow-up on the Twitter story we reported yesterday. But first, I want to tell you about NatureBox. NatureBox is a fantastic way for you to subscribe to awesome treats like this, healthy snacks, uh, and you can get them by mail. Uh, it's a fantastic, fantastic service because they have so many delicious products, and they're all very healthy with zero trans fats, zero high fructose corn syrup, and nothing artificial. If you're going to be snacking, which you know you are, uh, you should snack on healthy products. And also, it's a great way to discover new flavors that you've never imagined before because they're really creative things. Think, uh, they have products like barbecued kettle kernels, French toast granola. They have a bunch of different granola. It's all very good. Chili lime pistachios. You've never had pistachios flavored like chili and lime. You are in for a treat. And it's also a fantastic gift. You can gift somebody a Nature Box subscription. You can order a three, six, or 12-month subscription for that person. It's great for if your kid's at college or something like that and you want them to eat healthier, you can just buy them a subscription and they'll get healthy, healthy snacks delivered right to their dorm. 
To get 50% off your first box, go to naturebox.com slash twit. And remember that to stay full and stay strong, go to naturebox.com slash twit. And we thank Naturebox for their support of Tech News Today. Well, we told you yesterday about how Twitter is becoming even more like Facebook. And we talked about the possibility that Twitter might add something similar to Google Plus's interactive posts, which enable downloads directly. Well, now we've learned that Twitter is planning to release a mobile ad product targeted at app makers. The format is called App Install Ad, and it's designed to encourage users to download the advertised app straight from the ad, according to a report on Bloomberg. Twitter's been testing App Install ads for at least several weeks, and one mobile app maker contacted by Bloomberg said co the cost of acquiring each new app user dropped by four-fifths using the new format. So this could prove to be a popular thing for small developers of apps who want to advertise on Twitter. Well, in other news, in explaining why Facebook spent $2 billion on the company that makes the Oculus Rift virtual reality goggles, Mark Zuckerberg said Oculus has the potential to be the most social platform ever. So a Montreal-based collective called Co-op Mode tested, okay, they mocked the idea, by creating an app for browsing Facebook using Oculus Rift. The app use, lets you wander around in this 3D environment where all the walls show the live Facebook pros, pro, profiles of your friends. The app, which looks like some kind of nightmarish version of Doom or something, is called Face Rift. What else could it possibly be called? Well, I want to thank Elise Hu for guest co-anchoring today. Uh, she's always great to have as a guest co-anchor. She's taken off. She has other things to do since we had a little bit of a glitch with the TriCaster. Uh, and um, you should know that there are lots of ways to subscribe to Tech News Today, and I recommend... Uh, all of them. One of them is just to go to twit.tv slash TNT. You can subscribe to the audio version or the video version as a podcast. You can also subscribe to our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash tech news today. And we want to hear from you. Let us know what's on your mind. Send us an email at TNT at twit.tv or leave us a voicemail by calling 260-TNT-SHOW. Also, don't miss our evening newscast, Tech News Tonight at 4 p.m. Pacific, tonight and every weeknight. My name is Mike Elgin. I thank you for tuning in and we will see you Monday.